a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's show, we'll bring you a report about the women who've joined the Islamic State group, whether by force or choice. One short movie takes a look at Egypt's lost generation, young men who are struggling with employment and marriage. Also on this week's show, we're joined in the studio by Mohammed Al Qadi, a Palestinian activist whose running is his tool. We start with Raqqa, which has been ruled by the Islamic State group for some three years, but the city has been liberated. The Syrian Democratic Forces, an alliance of Kurdish and Arab forces backed by the United States, say clearing operations are now underway to uncover jihadist sleeper cells. Now to the women of the Islamic State group. Whether by choice or force, they've pledged allegiance to the militant fighters. The terror group has now even taken the unprecedented step of calling on its female supporters to take up arms against their enemies. Now some of them have been captured and are currently detained in Erbil. Here's Julia Kim. I pledged allegiance to the Islamic State group at the beginning of 2015. I promised in front of the organization's tribunal to be faithful and obedient. When people on the street saw me wearing the Islamic State headband, they were afraid. They ran away because they knew I was part of the group. We meet with 35-year-old Afna, a former member of the militant's morality police in the offices of the Iraqi prison service, where she's serving a 15-year sentence. Steely-eyed yet nervous, she recounts her mission in South Mosul to make the women conform. I had to arrest women who weren't respecting Islamic law, those who didn't wear their veils properly or who didn't wear gloves or socks. It wasn't easy for me, but I had to do it. The penalty was 15 lashes. We also punished the husbands for letting their wives out like that. Raised in a religious family in a working-class neighborhood, Afna admits she didn't join the Islamic State group as a fanatic. She did it for the money. My husband is old and doesn't work anymore. It was hard for me and my children. To join the Islamic State organization, they paid me 700 euros, then 400 euros every month. In disadvantaged areas, the jihadists paid two to three times more than the average wage. Reason enough for Afna to close her eyes to their crimes. As the militants face defeat, more and more women are being captured by Kurdish and Iraqi forces. They're often quick to repent. But Arye, a member of Iraq's Yazidi community, persecuted by the Islamic State group, warns they shouldn't be believed. At 11 years old, she was kidnapped and enslaved, living at the mercy of the men and women of the organization. To the woman, we Yazidis were servants. They beat me and insulted me daily. I was locked up. If I wanted water, I had to ask them for permission. It was hell, dealing with the humiliation every day. Sometimes they were even worse than the men. After what she suffered, Arie feels no sense of female solidarity with these women. She'll never forget, like the thousands of others, degraded and terrorized by the Islamic State group. But the tables have turned. Now it's the militants who are afraid. In this refugee camp, a few kilometers from Mosul, the families of their victims live alongside the families of their henchmen. Amal Saeed is the wife of an Islamic State group fighter. She says she doesn't support her husband's acts of violence. He joined them because he was unemployed. We've six children. We needed to eat. He was obliged to work for them, and he died for them. I can't go back to my village anymore. People have taken my house, my furniture. All I have now is this tent. I see how people point at my children. I hope this passes, but I'm a bit scared now. Whether active or passive, the female accomplices of the Islamic State group are paying the price. But for their children, the future is uncertain. In the eyes of Iraqi society, they are the spawn of evil. 
In northern Iraq now, where the Kurdish military has lost even more territory, they've been pushed out of the disputed city of Kirkuk by government forces only weeks after the Kurdish region held a referendum on independence. Analysts say the incident has raised the possibility of a new civil war in Iraq. Now, they've been dubbed Egypt's lost generation. For young men living in the country, marriage along the centerpiece of Middle Eastern life is in crisis. Also, almost 90% of unemployed workers in Egypt are under 30. One filmmaker has even released a short film about this topic, which is now generating a great deal of buzz in the region. Here's a report from our correspondents. <laughs> This short documentary needs only a few minutes to present a portrait of disenchanted urban youth. It tackles everything from sexual or emotional deprivation to unemployment and illegal immigration. The subject of this film by Khalid Khayla is the unease of masculine youth. These are the struggles that make up every conversation among the 25-year-old director and his friends. You're not allowed to do anything. You're not allowed to travel. You, uh, you're not... Uh... To, to, to even to marry, it's, uh, it's very hard to, uh, uh, if you want to have a girlfriend, uh, people will annoy you in the street. You have to like uh, work too much in order to make too little money and be able to uh, live a normal life. Not a fancy life, just a normal kind of life, you know. Living a normal life in Egypt is Gamal's dream. He is confronted by a truly masculine problem. To get married, he must be able to afford gold jewellery for his bride. But the price of jewellery demanded by his in-laws is at least a thousand euros. This is a tall order for the young editor, who makes roughly the equivalent of 150 euros per month. <laughs> The economic crisis affects our daily lives. In order to get married, a man must buy gold or furniture, and he must be able to guarantee a decent wage. This is a problem that all young people are dealing with. Without money, Gamal had to delay his marriage at the risk of endangering his personal life. Like many young people without regular employment, he spends a lot of time in cafes. Beyond financial problems, Gamal believes that the principal problem for young people is the gulf between them and older generations. The difference is that young people like us live in a more connected world now. We have access to information online. This means we have access to culture. We are open to things that our parents weren't open to. 61% of the Egyptian population is currently under 30 years old. This generation is having difficulty finding their freedom in a society which makes little room for them. Now, he's run 10 marathons in 19 months, each time raising the Palestinian flag to bring attention to the plight of his people. However, 27-year-old Mohammed Al-Qadi was prevented from taking part in the Chicago Marathon earlier this month in the wake of a contentious travel ban imposed by the U.S. President Donald Trump. And uh, he joins us here in the studio. Mohammed, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. Now, how did all this start, your activism through running? You know, I was born in Palestine, and I grew up there. I learned in their schools. I'm a I'm proud Palestinian. So when I traveled here to France, I I said like I ha I should help my country because I I saw a lot of people being killed in front of my eyes. I saw people suffering every day. So at least I helped them. And since I don't believe in violence, I use marathon to 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 share awareness about them peacefully. Now, Hamad, what sort of reactions have you been getting? Presumably some voices of support and others who've been criticizing you. Actually, like when I when I want to run a marathon, I invite my, like a lot of people on my Facebook or Twitter and I get a lot of support because people like love that because people want want to know more about us. I run marathon with my flag and also like I see people cheering for me like like just two days ago I was in Amsterdam marathon I run it many flags was waving for me like everybody's supporting me sometimes I get people like who are against Palestine but it's normal like 
but I feel really, really proud because I can change. I can give a good image about my people because, like, we are simple people. Want to live like everybody. We don't want war. We want to live like everyone in this world. Now, Mohammed, you work alongside a number of uh, charities that support Palestinian children, but of course, you can't go back anymore. What happened? Actually, to tell the story, all the all the activists who work for Palestine, even on Facebook or on the on the air on the land, they cannot uh, enter Palestine. Or if they get try to enter Palestine, they will be arrested or or get problems. So like, it's so sad that I cannot come back to my country. Now, have you tried to go back? Yeah, I went one time, like uh, it was in 2013, and I entered, like, but I, I had a lot of problem. I waited six hours to enter, and a lot of questions, like, what do you do in France, and stuff like this. So, like, it's, it's really hard. Right now, it's really complicated. So, and even people write, like, a state on Facebook or a tweet can be arrested just for, for, this, for this tweet. So you applied for refugee status here in France back in 2014, but you were recently blocked from entering the U.S. to take part in another marathon, despite the fact that you are a French resident? Actually, I, I should uh, go to Chicago to run uh, the Chicago Marathon uh, like early this month. In order to enter to the U.S., I had to apply for a visa. I applied for a visa. They accepted me. I went to Paris to the embassy, and they said, you get the visa. Uh, and they will send it by mail to my home, and they send uh, they send me uh, my passport without uh, a visa, and they said that I'm not eligible to enter the U.S. You're not eligible to enter. Why do you think that is? Uh, actually, I think it's because the, the new laws, the ban, the new ban laws that they already uh, issued. The travel ban. Yeah, the travel bans. Actually, maybe this is a reason. Uh, or mo maybe because I'm, my name is Mohammed, or because I raised the Palestinian flag. In or we know all of us that United States support Israel. So I, I don't know actually the real reason, but maybe this is one of the reasons. Mohammed Al Ghadi, thank you very much for speaking to us on Middle East Matters. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you for watching the show this week. You can follow us on both Facebook and Twitter, and of course, follow us on podcast. Stay tuned to France 24.